I'm sure um, most of you noticed something strange when you came in this morning. Anybody? An expensive meal meal in the lobby. Uh, I don't know if anybody, did anybody sit down there? Anybody? Uh, One person. Okay. It's a glutton. All right. Uh, Hey, no, 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 no. (laughs) Jordan was? Dirk, attaboy, Dirk. <laughs> See, these older guys, they're not going to hold back. Eh? <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering this morning, if you assumed or you wondered who that table was set for. Who's that table for? Did you assume it was for someone other than you? No, you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> It's for rich people. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's true. Yeah, if you sat down at the table, you're going to get stuck with the bill. I get it. <laughs> you wonder who's the host and who's the guest? Why is it there? And ultimately today, I want to ask this question. Does that table have to do anything to do with you or me? Our goal will be to answer that question and So to do that, I want to survey a few verses from the Old Testament and see if we can make sense of what that table is doing there. If you could, we started this morning by reading Psalm 23, so I would love for you to turn there if you can. And then, I I read right up to it, but in verse 5, this is a Psalm of David, most of us are familiar with it. David makes a stunning statement. I mean, Psalm 23 is so good this statement sort of can pass under the radar, I think, when you read it. But David makes this statement about God, and I want to give it our full attention this morning. So if you turn, verse 5, David says this about God. He says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, what do we make of that verse? David is here declaring that his experience of God is exactly like discovering that there's a perpetual feast being continually set before him. This is what he's saying. Everywhere I go, you prepare a table before me. He's saying, my life with you, God, what I've learned is that it has been this ongoing surprise. And I'm not sure if any of, any of us can relate to that. But when you live with God, there's an ongoing surprise. Because around every corner, you find there's a table waiting for you. I like that. I was thinking about that this week. Thinking about wherever I go, there is a table. and Maybe you can play the game, but you sit down in your car and you imagine, you turn over and there's suddenly a table set before you. You get to work and all of a sudden you walk in your office and there is a table set before you. Where isn't there a table? David is saying this, I've concluded, I've made this summary statement about who God is. If you want to know who God is, he says, you are the Lord of hosts. And by that, he doesn't mean Lord of the angel armies, even though he is that. He says, you, <laughs> he says, you are the, Lord, the host of every banquet. You're the Lord of banqueting tables. For I always find in you an incredible feast that's always been prepared in advance for me, ready to receive me, calling me to rest, beckoning me and you to come and eat and be satisfied. I think that's, I think it's a beautiful thought, isn't it? And not just a thought, but a truth. David says, I've found that I'm being shepherded my life by a God who faithfully leads me to find the greenest pastures, the place of still waters. And that table keeps showing up everywhere in my life in the most unexpected and unusual places. Right? What does he say? It's in the presence of It's like an, even in the presence of my enemies, there you are with a table waiting for me. 
And the good news is the meal's expensive, but you don't have to pay for it. It's free, all right? So where does it show up? In church lobbies, it seems, in our time of need, in the good and the beautiful, in the presence of our enemies, because you, God, everywhere I go, have taught me that I don't have to wonder anymore. This is the conclusion David is hoping we will come to as well. He's learned to say this, make this confession about his life. Surely there will always be a table set before me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of my days, and I will live in your house. I will eat every meal at your banqueting table now and forever. And I'm wondering how well you and I know this. How well do you know this? How much is that your confession? Or are you able to say that? And I don't want you to, I don't want you to <laughs> judge this by what you've said, but I want to judge it by the way that you live. How true is that in your life? Now, all of that said, this is not David's unique experience. Does anybody believe that? See, the, the, there's today, the theme of God's people discovering an unexpected table before them is all throughout the story of Scripture. In fact, it's at the very heart of God. Tell me this. What else do you call, call it when manna rains down from heaven? What do you, what do you call that? That's an unexpected table set before you, isn't it? Uh, what else do you call quail appear, appearing in the desert when you're hungry? That'd be nice. I, I'm, I'm sure hunters would appreciate that, right? What do you call water bursting out of a rock? They are the unexpected tables prepared in advance by God for his people. Can you see the way that the Lord of hosts has been working over and over again to reveal himself to us and to his people? It's what he does. And I want you to know, God is earnestly desiring to express and reveal himself through the table. There's a verse we're gonna look at in a second, but that is actually from the Bible. God says, I earnestly have desired to eat this meal with you. Now think about, what's the first Passover meal in Egypt, right? It's, it's, a, it's a meal to sell, set up by God to celebrate in advance their deliverance from slavery. A meal that they were then commanded to keep remembering, keep remembering the meal and the host and the point of it. Every covenant promise in the Old Testament, every time God makes a covenant with people, it's ultimately marked by them sacrificing something on the altar. And we, because we're removed, we don't realize it. But every sacrifice on the altar ultimately becomes a table that turns into a feast. Everywhere they went, do you remember how it says Abraham, he would build these altars as places of remembrance about who God was. Well, when you walk by it, what do you see? You remember the promise and you remember the meal that you had, right? You remember. I remember God prepared a table before me. If he's done it then, he'll do it again. There's a great one. Who remembers Elijah fleeing Jezebel out into the wilderness? He's hungry, he's weary, and he's scared. And do you remember what God does? It says this. It says, God baked him a cake. You should read it. It says, God baked him a cake on some hot stones. It just appeared. Who remembers the, the widow whose oil, jar of oil and flour never runs out? A kind of, it's a kind of abundance, a perpetual feast that kept them fed right through the greatest time of need. Now, many of you have already anticipated how all of this table talk is you know, culminating in the life of Jesus, isn't it? We know that. We know where it's going. And that's a very good thing. Our anticipation, your anticipation this morning of looking at that table and realizing there's, a, there's the Lord's table <laughs> brings joy to the heart of God. You, this morning, I want you to know, you can't underestimate the joy that God experiences when we begin to anticipate his goodness. This is, this is what our lives are meant to be marked by. 
God is hoping, he's planned surprise parties for us all over the place, but he's hoping that we're not that surprised. You ever have that? You walk in and you go, oh, great, I knew it was coming. It still doesn't mean the party, it doesn't ruin the party. It means you just know that it's, it's there. See, Jesus is the king of unexpected meals in unexpected places, isn't he? Think about Jesus for a moment. Like, think this theme right from the beginning all the way through. All of these unexpected tables. I mean, if you took Jesus fishing, you better have your nets mended so that they don't break, right? This is the unexpected meal. If you take Jesus into the wilderness with like 5,000 people, you better have brought baskets so you can take home the leftovers, right? If you take Jesus to a wedding, here's good news, you won't have to worry about the wine. If you take him to an invite-only function, you better expand the seating capacity to accommodate his version of the guest list, right? It's an unexpected table. He's at the door calling all sorts of people to come. People that you didn't maybe expect to be there. What is, so ask this question this morning. What is Jesus? What has God been doing? What is this table all about? In all of these signs, what has God been preparing for us to taste and to see? To taste and to see. To taste and to see. Well, nearing the end of his life, knowing he was nearing the end of his life, Jesus shows, shows his disciples and shows us what he's been planning. He says to Peter one day, he finally says, the Passover's coming, he says, go and prepare a table for us, Peter. But then he tells Peter, so you think Peter's got a lot of work to do. But then he says, Peter, go here and it's all going to be set up. Just talk to the guy and say the code word and you realize there's a table above and everything's going to be set up. Go and prepare it. And then on the night that he's prepared the feast for his disciples, on that night that's meant to commemorate, to remember Israel's first deliverance from slavery, where the, where the strong right arm of God, the hand of God, delivered them out of, out of Egypt... Jesus intends to host a new, kind, a new kind of feast that would signify a better feast, a final and ultimate deliverance from slavery, right? Once and for all. He's saying, we're having the meal to end all meals. And this holy table is something you were meant to find. See, meeting God, if you want to meet God, you'll meet him at a table. That's where he'll be. God meets us at tables. And he's preparing a meal of what he's about to do for them, a meal to remember. And yet even at the meal, Jesus explains that this meal, he's like, guys, this is one meal, but... This is the start of much more. <laughs> this is the beginning of a meal that is never meant to end. You're going to eat this meal all the time. His Passover meal marked, that night marked the arrival of a banqueting table that you could visit whenever you wanted. Jesus, I mean, he, who knew Jesus was the Mandarin, right? <laughs> right? A 24-7, I don't know if they have, maybe those are in Vegas or something. There's 24-7 buffet, open all the time. Hopefully, he's a cruise ship, sure. <laughs> Whatever analogy, you got it. A buffet that appears before us whenever and whenever we simply turn to look for it. Now, don't, don't get cheap on me. Don't think, well, I'm going to go a little bit because I only have a little bit of money. It's free. It's open. It's available. And it's, what is the word we use to talk about this meal that we have? We call it communion. It is communion with God. It's, the table is a sign, the, the, the food is a sign of something deeper. It's not just something we eat, it's something we experience. It goes on forever. John himself said this, he said, this is eternal life that we in, and I'll just paraphrase, but it's to, to give framework. He says, this is eternal life that we intimately know God, that we commune with him. See, this communion 
meal was somehow endowed with the power, and I mean, just a side note, this is communion, but Jesus says any meal that you eat in remembrance, is a, I, this, is a, this is, you know, this doesn't satisfy our hunger, does it? You know, imagine you showed up to a really great party and they're like, listen, we got like hundreds of them. Like, we're going to drink and eat to our heart's content. And I said, no one ever, right? But it's a symbol of a, of a real meal that we eat together by faith as we remember God. And it's endowed with the power to not only satisfy your physical hunger, but renew your awareness of God's presence all around you. I don't know if you experienced it this morning, and this is generally my experience when we worship together, is I am aware suddenly of the presence of God. I'm aware. My spiritual antenna is up and I am receiving signals. God is here. (laughs) When we eat this meal, it's to renew our hearts in God's goodness and mercy that is, like David said, overflowing our cups. Now, I don't know if it's, it's, it's sacrilegious to say, imagine God being a bartender, but... I think it's true. There he is, the host going around, just filling up the cups to overflowing, filling up our cups to overflowing. To eat was to rest in peace, in the peace of God's grace, even as Jesus explained. Think about that night. Jesus is there eating, and what is the one weird thing about who's at the table with him? Who's eating at the table with him? And what does he make note of? He says, there's someone here that is gonna betray me. Jesus is singing Psalm 23 in his heart. And he says, God, you have prepared a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. I mean, it's wild, right? And this is the verse I love in Luke 22. When Jesus is setting up the whole night, the first thing he says when he comes to the, to the, to the, 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 the Passover feast that night, Jesus speaks to them as, His first words are this. He says, and I I want to paraphrase again, but he says, guys, you don't understand. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. Have you ever ever heard, have you ever said something more than once in, in in your mind? Like, you know, I just can't wait. To, I, like maybe you're getting married and you're thinking, I just can't wait to say the words to have to hold forever. I, I can't wait to tell, hold my child and look in their eyes and say, daddy loves you. What, what are the words? I mean, we all have words like that, don't we? And these words, I think, this is what Jesus has been longing to say. He finally gets to the table with them and it's spread out and there's a feast and he says, you don't know how I have earnestly desired to, for you to taste this meal. From the beginning, I've been inviting you. I've been inviting the world to come and find the table. I've been calling you to come and discover that this is the only feast that you need to eat. Because this bread is my body And this wine is my blood. See, on every level of meaning that food has in the world, to sustain, to strengthen, to satisfy, to be enjoyed, food does all those things. We are to see communion as a picture for understanding who he he truly is, who he wants to be. He wants to sustain us, to strengthen, to satisfy. God wants you to enjoy him like a feast. And we can come unworthy as we are, unprepared as we are, unqualified, surprised as we are that there's a table suddenly in the, in the lobby, in our rooms, in our places of betrayal or hurt or death or grief. And what do we find? A table of atonement and forgiveness. A table of strength and life. See, here he is, Jesus saying, I'm the, 
I'm the Passover feast. I'm the spotless lamb. He's the firstborn. Listen, he's the firstborn son of God who God did not spare on the mountain so that he might save us. The Lord of hosts is beckoning. Come to the table of grace. So I say all of that to say that that unexpected table that you found out there this morning is not just any table. It's a representation of the table of the Lord that is set before you and me, every single one of us. There's, you don't know how earnestly he's desired to eat with you. <laughs> the table is God's greatest joy. He gave it to us to remind us of his presence and provision or just a breath away. And, I, and it follows us. It just has this, right? Surely goodness and mercy follow me. <laughs> I don't know if there's, that's a, a weird picture. <laughs> just table, it's like a shadow. You just can't get rid of it. There's a table behind me. <laughs> and in a culture that we live in of fast food that promises a satisfaction, but we know ultimately leaves us empty about 30 minutes later, right? <laughs> he has given us the true food and true drink that lead to eternal life. At the table, guys, it's more than a meal. It's more than a meal. It's our home. The table is our home. It's our joy. It's our fulfillment. It's our peace. It's our rest. And it's our delight. And yet even knowing, we all, do we all know that? We're, 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 we're here saying, yeah, yeah, the table is the best. It's everything for us. And yet knowing all that, it's still easy to forget that, Right? It's easy to underestimate it. It's still easy to be, for, for this table to become just another table in a land full of really great tables. They're all over. There's tables everywhere. For us to overlook the importance of God's table in our hectic world, it's easy. For us just to supplement the food that we eat at other tables through the week because we're on the run. We're just moving, you know? In fact, it only become, begins, becomes easy to see how important this table is by slowing down. On a Sunday morning, it's easier to become aware of it because we're, we're resting here. We're, we're, we don't have to do anything. We're just coming to sing. And in those moments, this is what we usually, I mean, this is what I usually think. We, we think, why well, would I have ever thought about going anywhere else? <laughs> Isn't that the realization? Why? Why? Why have I been wasting my time? Why have I been worrying? Why have, have I been anxious? Why have I been fearful? Why have I been turning over that story of shame over and over again? And why am I letting that interrupt and change and ruin my life, ruin my peace? And yet we know that just as this is the story of the scripture, tell us, right? Just as there's an ongoing divine story of God as the table setter who invites and calls and goes before us, there's, there's also another concurrent story happening that, that the Bible tells a human story about how people who, though they are invited to the feast, that's always around them, that follows them, that's provided, that's free, they don't come. Is, and I, I can't... I, I, I don't have to guess that that's all of our stories, isn't it? Who have justified their stubborn eating habits in countless ways. I just got convicted. Um, <laughs> who, who know about the Lord's table, but also don't know how, how to find the table somehow that's before them. You're living in a, supposed to be a table around, but I'm, I just can't see it. And what's heartbreaking is that we, when we reject the table or we live apart from it, we live apart from God's grace, but we're choosing to eat on our own, to live, to eat alone. And it can happen quickly, very quickly. It might even happen today. <laughs> Exodus 24, it says, when Israel is delivered from Egypt, in one moment, I read, was rereading it this week. It's the wildest story. God appears to them in the desert. They make a covenant with God. He delivers them. He goes before them. All of the things are happening. And it says, they all, all the elders, the whole, like the company of them, Moses, and they're all brought to the, to the foot of the mountain that's basically blowing up with the glory of God. And it says they're there, they, they're invited by God, and there they be, and this is the verse, not paraphrased, 
They beheld God. Oh, now I'm paraphrasing, sorry. God hosted them and they ate and they drank with him. That's what it says. They ate and they drank with God. They feasted. And then God calls Moses up. And having eaten with God in mere weeks, they betray him for a golden meal of their own making. Right? We lo- hey, I don't blame them. We love the beef. And there they are. Right? A golden calf. A, go- a golden veal chop. There it is. They're worshiping it. God is, God's glory is literally hanging over them. And yet they worship and trust something of their own making instead. It's lunacy. You can't read it and not feel the tension. But don't let it be a story out there. Realize it's a story of right here. Psalm 78, and this is, this, it just gets crazy. Psalm 78 offers this chilling commentary of that generation. It says, they rebelled against the most high in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food that they craved. And they spoke out against God. And what do you think there's what they said to God? Listen to what they said. Can God, can God, can God spread a table in the wilderness? Are you really a host? Are you really someone who prepares tables for people? Can he give bread to provide? The heartbreak is that the very thing that God was about to do for them, they sought on their own and therefore ate alone. God had prepared a meal that he, and he never intended them for them to want. And so this is a, a good reflection for our lives. Where are we eating? And what is the table? And do we see it? Do we know it's for us? All that leads to the present moment. And I'm sure you can see behind me, uh, there's a, a slide that says slow and small and simple. And this is our third year talking about this. Last year, we focused on uh, the power of seeds. Does anybody, I don't know, someone still, Armando had his seed just the other day. Does anybody still have it? I'm afraid to ask. Okay, awesome. Last year, we talked about seeds. And this year, we're just take the same themes, but really apply them to the communion table. And if you didn't know, I'll just briefly explain. The genesis of the series Slow, Small, Simple is about six years ago, um, God spoke those three words to me. Uh, Those three words have grown in my heart. And when I first heard God speak them to me, slow, small, simple. Slow, small, simple. I perceived, you know, I I realized this is God's wisdom the wisdom of God for my life, at least. (laughs) This is a call from God. Hey, Mike, slow down. Go small. Consider what it means to be simple in the world. I mean, what a, it just felt like a gift to me. And those things have grown in my heart. And to me, they stand as like just boundary lines, just values that helped me differentiate between the, between the way of God's kingdom and the culture of the world, which is enamored, of course, with the opposite. Big, fast, complicated. And that's often what our lives feel like. For God seems to love moving in slow ways, doesn't he? <laughs> is anybody frustrated about that? <laughs> God seems to love to ascend to the small things of the soul, which confounds our self-importance, slows us down. God seems to love the simplicity of heart, which is a perpetual stumbling block for all of our pride. (laughs) We just want simple. And what I want us to grasp is that each of those three words, slow, small, and simple, are pivotal for our great need, to our great need to discern the presence of God, the presence of the table that has been set before us. And the reason is that if you want to come to the table, there's only one thing that's required. You have to be a really great person. I'm kidding. That's not true. What do you need? What's the one, what is the one thing that you need? Humility. Yeah, the humil- surrender. You have to be humble to come to the table. 
Humble yourselves before God. And that's what I think slow, small, and simple is ultimately about. It's teaching us the joy and the path of humility. Why? Because that is the the joyful path that Jesus walked, who considered not his own needs, but the needs of others, who gave up his life, right? And we will be nothing without humility. Pride in all of its manifestations will ruin your life and mine. And we must be ruthless to root it out. Pride is is an expression of evil and humility is an expression of obedience and trust. So how might slowness help us perceive or discern the table of God? If this is so important, if this is everything that we need, then what is our job to discern the table, to commune with God? You want everlasting, eternal life, discern the table. There are at least two ways that I think slowness helps us understand it. The first is this, is that we, it's good to admit that most of us are moving too fast to really eat, right? Too fast to eat. Isn't this true in a frantic and fast-paced culture that we are uniquely conditioned, we're just moving all the time to miss the table of God? How exactly? Well, who's familiar with the term uh, motion blur, right? Have you ridden on a subway? Mo- yeah, okay, yeah, I see it. I see that hand. Um, <laughs> if you've ever traveled fast-paced in a car or subway, things that are only a foot away from you that aren't moving as fast as you, what do they do? They look blurry. I remember you're, I kind of played this game when I used to take the subway in Toronto. You'd, you'd see the, the advertisement on the wall. The, the wall's like right here. You're by the window. And you're watching it as you come into the station. Everything's, right? It's all whirring past you. And all of a sudden, you're trying to like, I'm like, can I read? Can I read? Can I read? And finally, there's that point where the train is slowing down just enough that you start to see words, letters, phrases, all of a sudden, images. And then it's all clear as it stops. The only way not to miss the table of God is to slow down. It's the, it's the, it's the same with the table. Mo- the reason most of us discern its presence or experience, its depth and magnitude, is because of the pace of our life. It's there for us, but we haven't slowed down enough to see it. And here's what I want us to understand. In our culture, our pride, the pride that we're trying to root out, and our independence don't always show up the way we think. You might think, I'm not a prideful person. I don't struggle a lot with pride. But today, most of our pride dresses itself up as busyness and impatience. And when that's acceptable, and that's acceptable to most of us. And because of that, we literally settle for fast food. We can only eat at places where they have a window where we don't have to get out of the car. We just... Run by and grab it. We don't think about our busyness as disobedience because we tolerate and we venerate it. And yet, how different is that attitude from the, from the attitude that sunk the Israelites in the desert? It says, in their haste, in their impatience, they sunk to demanding the food that they craved. In their impatience, they zoomed right past the table of God that he prepared for them. Here's what I want you to know. Most people would say, when they talk about humility, they say it's hard to measure humility. True? Right? As soon as you start talking about humility, immediately it's kind of gone (laughs) because you're talking about it. And humility is, I think, in some ways shy because it's so focused on serving others. True humility. But ultimately, I think humility can be measured by our awareness of our need for God. How aware, to the depth that you are aware of your need for God and leaning into him, you can actually probably determine just how humble of heart you truly are. The second thing is that when we do come, this is how slow helps us at the table, when we do come to the table, we're ultimately eating too fast to really change. Have you ever watched a marathon runner on a route? 
trying to get those carbs and energy and water into them. They're just, they're just ripping along and there's people holding out water, kind of running along beside them and they just grab it, they tuck, chuck it back and then they throw it away, right? They have to, they don't use toilets on the run, they just go for it, wow. right? They're just, poof, no time to stop or slow down. But God, well, he's gracious to meet us on our roots. <laughs> Ultimately, God's table, the real change that we want you can't get at that pace. God's meal is life-changing. I, th I think it says out there, there's multiple courses. It can't be rushed. God's table is fine dining, even though it's a buffet. <laughs> and there are at least four courses. There's more, but I want us to think about four courses because communion is an act, first course, of representation. It's an act of examination an act of anticipation, and an act of proclamation. Have you ever tried to do any of those things slowly? When you come to the table, the reason you're coming is to feast on this wonderful fact, to just like gaze up at the cross of the wonder of the God who became like us. You're, that is your representation. That is, you're looking up and you're saying, that, that one on the cross is just like me. He's dying there for me. He's representing me where I should be. He's taking my sin and my shame. And this morning, you don't need to live with sin and shame if you have it in your heart this morning. You don't need to. He's represented you on the cross. He's hanging there so you don't have to. And when we see that, it leads to this other thing that we do, which is examination. We examine our hearts so that we might confess the ways in which we have sinned. The ways in which we have lived our lives apart from God in our pride and our independence. And we all have sin. The only way to get rid of it, though, is you have to confess it. You have to name it and declare your need. And I want to suggest that we don't rush past the examination phase. Shallow repentance will be <laughs> the ruin <laughs> of our joy and our peace. We won't change, right? As we do that, as we realize he's there for us and we're examining our own hearts and laying them out before God, we begin to anticipate and connect to a future feast that Jesus is pointing out. He said, this feast is, is ultimately going to culminate in, in, the, in, the, in the bridal feast of all of creation coming together, right? Have you read end of, the end of Revelation? There's a feast that marks it all. The Supper of the Lamb. And at that feast, we know all, everything will be restored and made right. And we're anticipating, when we eat, we're not just eating because God has forgiven us, and that he took our place. We're eating because we know that God is now by his spirit renewing us and ultimately will renew the whole world. He will come back and make all things new. And we're, believe, we're anticipating that. We're eating happily, right? We're saying no matter what happens, God is keeping us. And then lastly, he, Paul says this whole act, 1 Corinthians 11. He says this whole thing is a proclamation of the good news that Jesus died so that we might be saved. I want you to know this morning, it struck me today, who needs you to eat this cup regularly? Who needs you to find the table? You do. Who else? I need it and you need it. I need you to eat at the table. I need you to eat at the table. I need you to eat at the table. We all need each other to eat at the table and the world needs us to eat at the table because otherwise, how are they going to hear the good news? You want to proclaim the gospel? Paul says, do this. Eat at the table with joy and gladness, having been forgiven by God and reconciled and, and made at peace, not living under the weight of guilt or shame, not living for yourselves anymore, but living 
for Jesus and for his kingdom. When we do that, when we eat this, we remind ourselves of who we are. And who needs that? You and me together, because we're a family. And the world needs it because we're wanting to invite them in to this table to come and feast. You want to feast? Come and feast. Have you ever seen, maybe we can put up that image, Rocco. I don't know if recently you've seen any of these wildly clear images that they're getting recently of planets all around us. Have you seen these online? There's just these, like look at this. This is uh, Jupiter. It's incredible. Now uh, this is, I, can only, I just showed you one just to show, like go take a look. It, it's, it's wild, the pictures they're getting, the clarity. And I kind of, I was wondering to myself aloud, like just as I was, I was like, wow, that's the best picture of a planet. Like there's pictures of the moon that they are stunning. And I thought, how are they getting these pictures? How does this happen? And I realized, I I did a little uh, Google research. Here we go. (laughs) That this picture isn't just a single picture. Did you know that? This is... This is comprised, this picture here of Pluto is comprised of over 600,000 different images taken over a two hour period by a telescope that are then integrated by a supercomputer at NASA. And then this is, the, this is the, ultimately the image of like the clearest image they can get from all of those shots put together. And I want you to know it is stunning what you can see what you see when you slow down. When you don't just do one quick look at the cross, but when you gaze at it and you let your heart, like, you know, like a photographer just snapping pictures, it's your wedding day and you're just click, click. And you, you look through your album and you're going, I remember all of that, all of that. And by the time you get to the end, your heart is full, right? Because you see all of the, the beautiful things that happened. The point is the beauty of God, the touch of his spirit, the comfort of his presence are not meant to be imparted, cannot be imparted or tasted or enjoyed in one quick look in the rush. If you've been longing for the depth of God, then don't look quickly, look long. Stare up, gaze. Give yourself enough time to be filled with wonder. Let your life slow down enough that you can start to hear the sound of God's voice. And you begin to see and and realize the presence of God's table all around you. All right, I don't think I need to belabor the point anymore. It's not difficult to understand. I just want to invite us to the table that's set before us today. And I want us to slow down for a moment as a family together to gaze at God's magnificence that can't be grasped in one moment but requires a lifetime. In Revelation, do you remember that picture there is? There's all these creatures with, they're, they're, it says they're full of eyes and they're all looking at the, at the lamb and they're all bowing down in continual worship. How many eyes do you need? For how long are they worshiping there looking at the Lord? Essentially, his beauty is limitless and it's made to fill us. 